Up to this point, we've talked about vectorizing documents using bag of words approaches, whether it's binary, frequency, or TF-IDF. In this module, we'll go down one level and talk about how to vectorize words themselves and why that's useful. Specifically, we'll cover something called static embeddings and how they can help us capture some aspects of a word's meaning. I underline the word static because the NLP world has moved on to more powerful, contextualized embeddings, which we will cover later in this course. And so we're not going to spend too much time on static embeddings, but it's important to understand a few core concepts here because they form the foundation for further material. They're also still very cool and can be useful for building base models. Let's start by talking about the simplest way to vectorize words, which is one-hot encoding. One-hot encoding is a concept we've already encountered when vectorizing labels for multi-class classification, and it's just as straightforward when applied to words. Say you have this eight-word vocabulary, sorted alphabetically. A one-hot encoding would mean having each word represented by a vector the size of our vocabulary, in this case eight, where each element represents one of the words. The word being represented has its index set to one, and the rest are set to zero. So the word cat would be an eight element vector where counting from one, the third element is set to one and the rest to zero. The vector for the word feline would have a one in the fifth position and zeros for the other positions. Pretty simple. The trade-off for the simplicity is that we end up with a sparse representation. With a 20,000 word vocabulary, each word is going to be represented by a 20 element vector with only one element set to one, which can be wasteful to both store and process. But the bigger problem is that these vectors don't capture any meaning or relationship between words. We know the words swim and swimming are related, and so are cat and feline. Even bus, car, and road have a relationship to each other in our minds. But with one-hot encoding, the dot product of the vectors of any pair of words will always be zero. In other words, they'll appear as having zero similarity, which we know isn't true. So we're not capturing any information about the words with this approach. Instead, it would be nice to have vectors which are short and dense so that we can be more efficient with computation and storage, and at the same time, capture some meaning of the words themselves. This is where embeddings come in. An embedding is a representation of a discrete item, such as a word, a book, or a movie, as a vector of real numbers. Usually this vector is of relatively smaller dimension. These discrete items can be anything and include something abstract, like graphs. For example, let's say we have a collection of movies and we want to represent each movie as an embedding. In this case, let's say a five-dimensional vector. Each element of this vector can represent a genre such as action, comedy, and so on. And we can rate the amount of action a movie contains on a scale from zero to one. I just made that scale up, but it can be anything. It can be in minus 100 to plus 100 if you like. And we can do the same with the other elements as well. Perhaps a vector or embedding for a movie like The Godfather has a moderate 0.5 for action, a 0.2 for comedy, and scores higher for drama. As you can see, an embedding is not a probability distribution. The numbers in this vector do not add up to one. A movie like The Big Lebowski, on the other hand, would score lower on action and higher on comedy. And we could get a bunch of movie fans to hand engineer these vectors. And once we have them, we would have the data for a really simple recommendation engine. If someone enjoys a movie like The Godfather, we could check the cosine similarity of The Godfather against other movies and return the closest matches. Alternatively, we could cluster movies together based on these vectors. The important thing is, movies with similar attributes would be closer together in vector space. If our collection of discrete items were persons, we could represent a person using a three-dimensional vector of age, height, and weight. These vectors would then exist in a vector space and we could find cohorts of people with similar attributes. Okay, so what we're doing is mapping discrete items to points in a vector space. These points are called embeddings. And we can do this with words. With words, we want embeddings which capture some meaning such that, when placed in a vector space, similar or related words should be closer to each other. So words such as swim and swimming should be close. And this is an example of syntactic similarity. The same applies to words such as feline and cat, an example of semantic similarity. And conventionally, so should car, bus, and road, which is an example of semantic relatedness. Why is this useful? As a simple example, let's say you have two sentences, dog bites man, canine nips human. Vectorizing these two sentences with the bag of words techniques we've seen so far results in a cosine similarity of zero, but we know they do share a similarity. By using word embeddings to represent these two sentences, we would get a similarity score, and we'll see that in the demo. 
With embeddings, we move from describing documents based on whether a word is present to incorporating some statistical meaning, which is powerful in every NLP application, from classification to translation to question answering. So, how could we go about creating these vectors? Consider these four sentences. The puppy ate the slipper, the puppy chased the ball, the dog barked at the door, the dog fetched the stick. All right, now consider these three sentences. The wombly boo fetched the slipper, the wombly boo barked at the ball, the wombly boo chased the squirrel. Now, what's a wombly boo? I have no idea, I just made that up. But if I were to ask you to guess, I'd bet that you'd say it's some kind of animal, pet, or maybe a type of dog. And that would be reasonable because of the context or words surrounding wombly boo. In this case, words such as slipper, chased, ball, barked, and fetched all occur close to puppy, dog, and wombly boo. And so it's reasonable to assume puppy, dog, and wombly boo are related to each other in some way. This leads to the distributional hypothesis. Words which occur in similar contexts, or put another way, share similar surrounding words, have similar meanings. And this is the most important takeaway from this video because the concept of context giving meaning to words will come up again when we talk about contextualized embeddings. There are a variety of algorithms which leverage this hypothesis to create word embeddings automatically. One such algorithm is word to vec which learns dense representations which capture word relationships, and it was revolutionary when it was introduced. This is an actual 300-dimension word to vec embedding for the word cat, as you can see, it's dense and short compared to a one-hot encoding. The dimensions of these vectors typically range from 50 to 1000 and are sometimes called word vectors or distributed representations. In this video, we'll use the term word vector and embedding interchangeably. And hopefully it's clear why we'd like an algorithm to learn these embeddings for us because populating a 300 dimension vector by hand for thousands of words isn't feasible. Now, much like neural network parameters, the values in these dimensions don't have a clear interpretation. Maybe the first element encodes some idea of petness, the second animalness, and so on. What matters is that, once generated, words which are related in some way should have vectors which are closer together in this d-dimensional space. Let's look at how word to vec works. word to vec is actually a collection of two algorithms, both of which learn word vectors indirectly through a word prediction task. One algorithm is continuous bag of words. The idea behind it is similar to our puppy, dog, wombly boo example. So given a set of words with one word missing, the algorithm has to guess which word that is, like a fill in the blank puzzle. The other is skipgram, which given a word, the algorithm has to guess the words surrounding context words. And through this word prediction task, embeddings are created. Skipgram is the more popular and usually more accurate algorithm, so we'll focus on that in this video. And specifically, we'll focus on a modified and optimized version, which uses a technique called negative sampling. The goal of Skipgram with negative sampling, or SGNS, is to create vectors which first maximize similarity, so the dot product, between words which appear in similar contexts. So words such as dolphin and whale should be pushed closer in vector space since they tend to occur in similar contexts. Second, minimize similarity between words which do not. So a word like ketchup should be pushed away from dolphin and whale. This of course depends on the corpus we train on. If we train on a corpus where dolphin and ketchup frequently appear in similar contexts, then we're going to get word vectors which reflect that. So keep that in mind because it's a primary source of bias. All right, so diving in, let's say we have this passage. I have passes for the Miami Grand Prix this weekend and pretend it's part of a corpus. With SGNS, one word is always designated the input or target word. In this case, let's say it's Miami. And there's a context window on either side of the target word. In this example, we're using a context window size of 2, but the window size can be treated as a hyperparameter. The words inside the context window are called the output or context words. This setup can be treated as a sliding window. So if we slide one word to the right, the target word becomes gran, and the context words change accordingly. If the target word is at the end of the document, then only the left context window in this case applies. So going back to the original example, we'll pair each context word with the current target word, forming these four context target pairs. For Miami, the Miami, Grand Miami, Pre Miami. We can treat these pairs as positive examples. And each time we move to the next target word and slide the context window, we'll generate a new collection of positive samples. 
At the same time, we'll generate negative samples. The target word Miami remains the same, but this time, we'll pair it with a random word sampled from the corpus vocabulary. We can consider this random word a negative context word. And so let's say we end up with this collection, Mountain Miami, Elephant Miami, Rice Miami. Note how the word pre, which is in the current context window, ends up being sampled here. It is okay if that happens. And once we've gone through the corpus and generated a bunch of positive and negative samples, these pairs form our training set. Note how there was no manual explicit labeling. All the training data is generated from the corpus itself. This is an example of self-supervised learning, and it's powerful because there's no need for human annotation or labeling. We can throw billions and billions of words at this algorithm and have it learn representations for us. Anytime we can leverage data to automatically generate a supervisory signal is a big win. And we're going to see more of this later in the course. This training set will be used to optimize a binary prediction task. That is, given two words, are they likely to occur close to each other in the text? We don't actually care about this task, but as we'll see, doing this task well will generate the word vectors we actually care about. Once we have our training set, the next step is to create two matrices, W and C, which will hold our embeddings. W will hold embeddings for our target words, and C will hold embeddings for our context words. To be sure, they'll store embeddings for the same set of words, so the word Miami will be in both matrices. It's just that when Miami is a target word, its embedding in W will be updated. When Miami is a positive or negative context word, its embedding in C will be updated. These matrices will be randomly initialized and have the same dimensions, so one row for each word in our vocabulary, and columns equal to the number of dimensions we want. So if our vocabulary has 10,000 words and we want 300 dimension embeddings, W and C will each be 10,000 by 300. Finally, we'll one-hot encode each word in the vocabulary, and we'll see why next. Okay, so we have our training set, our initial embedding matrices, and we've one-hot encoded the vocabulary. Training proceeds as follows. For each iteration, pick one positive sample. So let's say the Grand Miami pair gets picked. The next step is to retrieve the embedding for each word. Let's say this is the one-hot encoding for the word Grand, because Grand is a context word We'll multiply this one-hot encoding with the context embedding matrix. Here's the key point. Because the word grand is represented by a one-hot encoding, multiplied by the context embedding matrix results in a single row from that matrix. In other words, this is the same as a lookup operation. So in implementation, it isn't necessary to use a one-hot encoding. We can just encode words with an integer index and perform an index operation as long as everything is consistent. We'll see this in the demo. Once we have the embedding for the word grand, we do the same thing for the word Miami. The only difference is that we draw the embedding from the target embeddings matrix. Now we have our positive sample as a pair of vectors. Next, we'll pick k negative samples. k is a hyperparameter, which we'll discuss later on, but for now, let's say k is 3. And say we end up sampling these three pairs. We'll take these pairs, draw their embeddings in the same manner, and we now have negative samples in vector form. Going back to our binary prediction task, given two words, are they likely to occur close to each other in the text? The probability of a positive sample given a positive context word and a target word looks like this. Remember that similarity is measured by dot product, so we'll dot product the context word and target word. And since we're looking at probability, this gets wrapped in a sigmoid which we covered in the neural network modules. But we also have negative samples to consider. So in a similar vein, the probability of a negative sample given a negative context word and a target word is 1 minus the probability of a positive sample. And if we work out the math, the function looks like this. The training process should arrive at vectors which maximize these two probabilities. To that end, this is the loss function. Working in log space, there's one positive sample prediction and one prediction for each negative sample we have, and those results are summed. So a total of k plus one predictions. And there's a minus sign in front of it because the goal is to minimize this result. And as we saw in the previous slide, the probability calculation is just a matter of taking the sigmoid of the dot products. After the loss is calculated from one iteration, training continues through stochastic gradient descent. The embeddings are updated using these derivatives. The embedding for each context word gets updated. For example, 
that would be the words Gron, Mountain, Elephant, and Rice for a total of k plus 1 updates in the context embedding matrix. So these derivative values would be multiplied by some learning rate, then subtracted from the current embeddings for those words to arrive at updated embeddings. The embedding for the target word would be updated using this derivative. Same idea, multiply this derivative by some learning rate, then subtract it from the current embedding for the word Miami to arrive at an updated embedding for that word. That completes one iteration. It repeats from there by sampling another positive sample and k negative samples, and it keeps going for either a certain number of epochs or until some metric value is reached. Through a number of iterations, the embeddings should shift such that related words end up with vectors which are closer together. A few additional notes about this algorithm. As mentioned earlier, k is a hyperparameter and the creators of word to vec Mikolov and colleagues, suggest a k value of 2 to 5 for larger datasets and 5 to 20 for smaller datasets. When creating the negative samples, the context words are drawn from a smoothed out unigram distribution. So the probability of sampling the word dog isn't just the number of times the word dog appears divided by the total number of words. Rather, both those counts are raised to the power of a hyperparameter alpha, usually set to 0.75. The effect of this is that it increases the probability of sampling a rare word and decreases the probability of sampling a common word, such as a stop word. If you're wondering why 0.75 for alpha, it's because the creators of word to vec tried a bunch of different values, and this seemed to work the best. We talked about how the size of the context window is also a hyperparameter. Papers have shown that narrower windows are better able to capture functional similarity, whereas wider windows are better able to capture relatedness or topic domain information. I've linked to papers which discuss this hyperparameter value and others depending on the goal. All right, so we've gathered our training data, set our hyperparameters, and ran the algorithm over the data for a certain number of epochs to create the desired embeddings. The common practice at this point is to take the target word embeddings as the final product and throw away the context embeddings. Alternatively, we can summate or even average the two matrices and take the result as our vectors. If everything went well, then we hopefully have effective embeddings for our downstream task. Speaking of which, there'll typically be three ways word vectors will be used in models. The first is using pre-trained vectors as model inputs and keeping the vectors fixed during training. So for example, say we want to classify documents and we don't have a lot of data to create our own embeddings. We can download pre-trained word embeddings from somewhere else and use them to represent our documents. And we'll cover how to do that in the demo. In this case, the training algorithm will try to optimize the model on the classification task, but won't touch the word vectors. So the gradients will not propagate all the way back to the word vectors and adjust them. The second scenario is the same as the first, but this time, we allow the learning algorithm to adjust or fine tune the word vectors during training. So for example, perhaps at the beginning of training, the vector for the word bat is at this location in vector space. During training, however, the learning algorithm is now free to adjust the vector for bat or any word if it leads to a better outcome. This means by the end of training, the vector for bat might be somewhere else in vector space. Something to keep in mind. The last scenario is to train word embeddings from scratch alongside our model. Here, the embedding matrix will be initialized randomly, and the training algorithm will adjust the embeddings to serve the task. Note that the resulting embeddings will be optimized for whatever loss function we're using. The goal here isn't similarity or relatedness, so the embeddings will likely be different than what word to vec would produce. And this is a good option if you have enough data or you need to do something domain specific and it's important to eliminate any ambiguity. So with that, let's look at a demo to see word vectors and these scenarios in action. All right, so here I've opened the NLP Demystified Word Vectors Notebook in Colab. You'll find a link to it on the module page. Alternatively, you can get to it through the NLP Demystified GitHub repo. One important thing before we begin is to enable GPU acceleration. And we can do that by going to Runtime at the top, Change Runtime Type, and selecting GPU. And this will greatly accelerate training. To illustrate word vectors, we're going to use GenSim, which we first encountered in the topic modeling module. GenSim also has support for word embeddings, including the ability to train them from scratch and also load pre-trained embeddings. At the time of this recording, Colab had version three of GenSim installed. So the first thing we'll do is upgrade to version four. I've already done that, so if you haven't, please pause and do so now. In this notebook, we won't train standalone embeddings from scratch because I want to focus on working with pre-trained embeddings and also training embeddings with models. 
But if you want to create your own standalone embeddings, coding SGNS from scratch shouldn't be too difficult now that you know the details. And I personally would just use the GenSim library, which can generate embeddings for you given a corpus. You can learn how to use GenSim to generate word vectors through these links here. Perhaps you can download some public domain text and run it through to see what you get. Okay, so the first thing we'll do is download some pre-trained word vectors. In this case, we'll use a set of vectors from Google. This collection we're downloading has 3,300,000 dimension word vectors, which were trained using a dataset of 3 billion words from the Google News corpus. The file is over a gigabyte in size, but it'll fit within our environment. And we'll set up the path to the file here. We'll load these vectors into GenSim's Heed Vectors module, which lets us look up vectors using token or integer keys, and also comes with utility methods to calculate things like similarity. To save time and memory, we'll load only 200,000 vectors for now. Retrieving a word's vector is simply a matter of indexing with the word. So here, we've retrieved the word vector for pizza. It has a dimension of 300, and this is the embedding itself. Once again, there's no clear interpretation to what these numbers mean, but as we'll see now, these vectors have been trained to include some relative meaning. GenSim has a similarity method which we can use to calculate the cosine similarity between two words. Here are the similarity scores between pizza against tomato, sauce, and cheese. So these words show some relation to pizza as we'd expect because they tend to occur in similar contexts. In contrast, pizza against gorilla, tree, and yoga yield much lower similarity scores. As an aside, out-of-vocabulary words like Womblibu throw an exception. Keep in mind that the entire Google collection contains 3 million vectors, but we've only loaded 200,000, so there may be a few words which seem common, but aren't available here as a result. We can also perform similarity between sentences using GenSim's n-similarity method. The method expects sentences as a list of words, which is why we're splitting on spaces here. Under the hood, the vectors making up a sentence are averaged, and that average is used as an embedding for the whole sentence. So for the first sentence, the word vector for dog, bites, and man are added and divided by three to create one embedding, which is then compared against the average of the other sentence to yield a similarity score. And here we see a decent similarity as we'd expect. On the other hand, these two sentences show much lower similarity. But one critical weakness is that word order gets thrown out. So two sentences which use the same words but mean different things will have a perfect similarity score, like this dog bites man and man bites dog example. Still, averaging word vectors to represent sentences is quick, convenient, and actually works pretty well for base models, as we'll see. In general, I think the more domain-specific your data is, the better results will be, like this example of news headlines about the automotive industry. GenSim also has a most similar method, which returns the closest vectors to a given word. Here are the 10 closest words to cell, and as you can see, the results lean towards biology and includes immune cells, molecule, proteins, and so on. Now, here's a cool thing. What if we add the words cell and phone together? then ask for the top 10. The results this time include terms like telephone and cordless phone, and other results which leans towards telecommunications. We'll see how this works when we look at analogies. There's also a doesn't match method which returns the odd word out from a collection. Here, hamburger is the odd one out from the rest of the fruit words. Under the hood, GenSim is returning the vector which is furthest away from the mean of all the vectors. This makes sense because we'd expect fruit vectors to cluster together and hamburger to be further away. We can even do the same with entities. Here, Toyota gets flagged as the odd one out because tech companies likely cluster together in vector space, and while Toyota is also a multinational corporation, it's not in the same domain, at least as far as news is concerned. Let's visualize a few of these vectors. These vectors are of dimension 300 in length, but if we want to plot them on a two-dimensional graph, we'll need to reduce the dimensionality. Here we're using a technique called principal components analysis, which is a dimensionality reduction technique which minimizes information loss. This is a simple function to generate the plot. Here, we'll plot the words from the slides. 
and I'll open this in a new tab to get a clearer look. As we discussed, we're seeing what we expect at least conventionally. Swim and swimming are close together, cat and feline are close to each other, then dog, but dog is part of the same cluster, roughly, and car, road, and bus are also roughly in the same neighborhood. Before we move on, let's look at solving analogies, which was one of the more impressive examples when word to vec first came out. Here we want to solve the analogy, Rome is to Italy, as London is to blank. Arithmetically, what we're doing is adding the vectors of Italy and London, and subtracting Rome. And if we run that, we get sensible results. UK, Britain, United Kingdom. To get a better grasp of how this works, we'll plot the three words plus Britain and UK here. I'll open this in a new tab as well. So we can see that when London gets added to Italy, we end up with a vector somewhere higher up. And when subtracting Rome, it moves to the area where UK and Britain are. Pretty cool. Even though the NLP world has moved on from these static embeddings, I still think it's amazing that a group came up with a simple, intuitive algorithm that was able to capture these relationships. Okay, now let's use these vectors to build a neural network model. To start, we'll load 1 million of the Google News Word vectors this time. What we'll do is classify Yelp reviews. If you don't know about Yelp, it's a review site for all sorts of businesses, from hotels to restaurants to medical offices. People write the reviews and give the business a star rating from 0 to 5. Specifically, we'll work with the Yelp Polarity Reviews dataset. This is a collection of about 600,000 reviews where the rating has been modified to just be either positive or negative. Now, TensorFlow comes with a dataset loader, which we can use to load these reviews, but we're going to instead start with raw data so we can practice prepping it ourselves. So the first step is to download the dataset, which comes in a zipped archive. Next, we'll unzip the archive into the default directory. And what we get are two CSVs, one containing the training data, another the testing data. Both files are in the content directory. We're going to use pandas to load the CSVs into memory. Here, we're loading the CSV containing the training data and providing names for the two columns in the data set. The data gets loaded into a pandas data frame, which you can think of as an in-memory table which we can operate on. And it has 560,000 reviews and two columns. We can look at the first few rows of the data set through the head method. So index is a column added by pandas to key into rows. Our data columns are sentiment and review. So for this first entry, the sentiment is one, which is negative, and the review, unfortunately, the frustration of being Dr. Goldberg's patient, etc., seems negative. The second entry has a sentiment of two, and the review seems positive there. So one for negative, two for positive. To save on training time in this demo, we'll use 100,000 reviews instead of the full 560,000. What we'll do is shuffle the dataset first, and then take the first 100,000. The reason why we're shuffling is to ensure we get a good mix of signals across different businesses. I've also set random state here to ensure you and I get the same sampling results. All right, so our trained data frame now has 100,000 reviews. The next thing we'll do is adjust the labels. This is a binary classification task, which means that our neural network model is going to have a single output unit feeding a sigmoid activation function. The output of this function is going to be between 0 and 1, and compared against the example's label. But our labels currently are 1 and 2, which is going to mess with the loss values. So we'll use the data frames replace method to turn the 1s into zeros for negative sentiment, and 2s to 1s for positive sentiment. And if we call head again, we'll see the labels are now 0 and 1. Just as before, we'll create train validation splits. So here, we're doing an 85-15 split, and then we'll extract the individual columns. The reviews become our inputs, and the sentiment labels become our targets. The array of labels gets converted from pandas series objects into NumPy arrays. It's always a good idea to perform cursory sanity checks as we go. Here we're checking out the balance between our labels, and it's pretty even. Next, as we did in the previous demo, we'll instantiate a Keras tokenizer. This time around, we're not going to bother doing any elaborate pre-processing. Rather, we'll have the Keras tokenizer do some light filtering, lowercase, 
and set up to tokenize only the most frequent 20,000 words. This is because we want our model to focus on the recurring keywords which best separate positive from negative reviews, and ignore words which occur rarely. Now that we have a tokenizer, we can build the vocabulary. Note that I'm using the training reviews only to build the vocabulary and leaving the validation data out of it. Next, we need to vectorize. In the demo on neural network foundations, each document there was vectorized into a binary array. We're going to do something different here. Here, we'll use the tokenizer's text to sequences method to turn each review into a sequence of integers. Each integer in the sequence maps to a particular token in the vocabulary. All right, so here's the first review from the training set vectorized into a sequence of integers. We can use the tokenizer's index word dictionary to retrieve the tokens corresponding to the first three integers. In this case, from my hospital. And we can recreate the review using the sequence to text method. If we compare it to the original review, we can see some light filtering was applied. So in the original review, we have these double new lines, and in the reconstructed review, the backslashes were removed, though the ends still remain. So the cleaning could have been better, but it's good enough here. Next, what we'll do is pad the review vectors so that they're all the same length. Some models and situations require padding, some don't. This situation does not require it, but we're going to do it anyway as an exercise because it doesn't hurt, and feeding batches of identically sized data to a GPU is generally more efficient. Here, we're capping the max review length to 200. So reviews longer than 200 elements will be truncated, while reviews shorter than 200 will be padded with zeros. I chose 200 just from eyeballing the reviews, but we could also do a more thorough frequency analysis as well. Looking at the results, we can see the first review is all non-zero, which means that it was likely truncated, while the second review was short and therefore pre-padded with zeros to make it 200 in length. Okay, we have vectorized and padded our training data. Let's now do the same with the validation data. Now, one last step before we can build our model. We need to get the word vectors from Gensim into Keras. Here's the Keras tokenizer's index for the word good. It's 34. And here's the Google News vector for the word good, the first 50 elements of it. So what we need to do is map the index 34 to this word vector and do the same with the rest of the tokenizer's indices. This way, as our model processes a sequence of integers, it'll use each integer to look up its corresponding word vector. It's exactly how we covered in the slides where the one-hot encoding of each word served as an index for an embedding. The only difference here is that the lookup will be done using an integer instead. This loop creates an embedding matrix. It works by initializing a zero matrix with the number of rows equaling the size of the vocabulary and the number of columns equaling the size of the embedding dimension. We'll then loop through each word in the tokenizer's vocabulary. And if the same word exists among the Google News vectors, then copy the vector over to the embedding matrix and store it in the row corresponding to the word's index. And that doesn't take long at all. There are more elegant ways to go about this, but the built-in approaches I saw were poorly supported, so I resorted to just copying things over. Now, if we look up the word good in our new embedding matrix, we have the same value stored there. Now, after all that pre-processing, building the model is straightforward. We'll start by creating a Keras embedding layer. You can think of a Keras embedding layer as a learnable lookup table. Two key points here. We're initializing this embedding layer with the embedding matrix we just created. We're just passing it in. Now, this way, each time Keras reads an integer from a vectorized review, it'll use that integer to look up a word embedding in this layer. Second, we're setting trainable to true. This means that as the learning algorithm trains a model to classify the reviews, it'll also be allowed to adjust these word embeddings for greater model performance. This corresponds to scenario two from the slides. The architecture for this model is simple. We'll once again use the sequential API which we first encountered in the previous module. The first layer is the embedding layer we just created. That'll transform the incoming integer sequences into a sequence of word vectors. And we'll take a closer look at that in a moment. Now, downstream from this, the dense hidden layers are expecting one vector per review. Plain feed-forward neural networks don't handle sequences like this. To account for this, we're inserting a layer called global average pooling 1D. 
All this does is collect all the word vectors for the review from the embedding layer, and then averages them into a single 300 dimension vector before passing it on. And that's how we'll turn a sequence of vectors into a single vector for the other layers to handle. The following two dense layers should look familiar by now. There's no science behind how I chose these widths. The idea is that signals from 300 dimensions get reduced down to 128 dimensions, which then get further reduced down to 64 dimensions before going to the output. Each step depending on the previous to remove noise and amplify useful information. The output layer is simply a single unit, feeding a sigmoid activation function, since we're doing binary classification. The compile call is also simple, and we're just using defaults for the optimizer. Note that I'm setting the random seed here, and also setting a seed for the initializers, so that you and I get the same weight initializations, and therefore the same results. If you want the weights to be initialized differently each time, just remove them. Alright, so just to be sure, here's an example of how some review text is going to be turned into a single vector. It starts with a text itself. Here we have a batch of one. That text gets turned into a sequence of integers, with each integer corresponding to a particular token. That sequence goes into our embedding layer, which acts as a learnable lookup table. The embedding layer looks at each integer in the sequence and returns its corresponding embedding. So the output from the embedding layer is actually a three-dimensional matrix. It's a batch of one, length of three, since there are three tokens, and each element is a 300-dimension word embedding. The global average pooling 1D layer will then do something like this, where the mean of the embeddings will be calculated, and the final output will be a single 300-dimension vector. And that represents the embedding for the whole review. Looking at the model summary, if you're wondering where this 28 million parameter number comes from, it's the number of tokens times the embedding dimension. Note here how there are no parameters for the pooling layer because we're just averaging multiple vectors into one. Next, we'll fit the model on the training data for 20 epochs and pass it the validation data as well to compare against. We won't use early stopping this time around so that we can plot the training and validation curves. Okay, so by the third epoch, we're already getting pretty good results for a straightforward approach. Keep in mind that if you're initializing your weights randomly, you'll be seeing something different, but it'll be close. I'll fast forward through the rest. All right, so the model got pretty accurate pretty fast. We can see by the third epoch, the training and validation losses started diverging, so it didn't take long to start showing signs of overfitting. Validation accuracy also starts flattening after that. Let's plot the loss and accuracy curves for both training and validation. This is the same code we used to do that in the previous module. Okay, so we'll plot that. And I'll open this in another tab. So the top graph is the training versus validation loss, and the bottom graph is the training versus validation accuracy. And they reflect what we saw in the raw numbers. Training and validation loss start diverging around epoch 3, while validation accuracy flattens out around that time. All right, let's retrain a new model with the same architecture, but this time with three epochs. Note here that we're reinitializing the embedding layer. This is because we set the learnable parameter to true last time, which means the learning algorithm almost certainly modified the embeddings. So we need to start again with the original embeddings for our new model. Okay, now that we have a trained model, let's prep the test set. So, same thing. First, load the training set into a data frame. Then, replace the labels. Turn the array of labels into a NumPy array. Vectorize the test reviews into sequences of integers. Pad the sequences. And finally, evaluate the model on the test set. All right, so we end up with about 93% on a straightforward model. Not bad. We can use this model now for predictions. This function just vectorizes, pads, and predicts. Here I have two real reviews from Google reviews, one positive restaurant review and one negative hotel review. If we ask our model to predict the sentiment on both, we get a high score on the first, low score on the second. Very cool. All right, so that was using pre-trained word vectors as inputs to a model. Another scenario we discussed was having the learning algorithm train embeddings from scratch simultaneously with the task. Let's try that here. We'll keep everything the same, except for the embedding layer. For the embedding layer, we'll specify the number of rows, the embedding dimension, 
and sequence length. The embedding layer will then be initialized randomly, and it'll be up to the model to learn both the embeddings and classification task. Okay, we'll let that run. Note that we're using early stopping this time around, and the patient's value is 3. And this is because we saw earlier that it tends to flatten a bit. And once again, I'm setting the seed so that you and I get the same results. Okay, so that didn't take long at all. We can see the validation loss again started diverging pretty quickly, but because we set the patients to 3, the training went on for a bit before stopping. We'll evaluate the model on the test set. Okay, it looks like performance is basically the same, indicating there's enough data here to arrive at good embeddings for the task, whether it's using pre-trained embeddings and allowing the model to tune them, or learning embeddings from scratch. Now, there is one more scenario that we haven't covered, using pre-trained embeddings and not allowing the algorithm to tune them. That is, keeping the embeddings fixed during training. So, give that a try. Instantiate our first model here, but this time, set trainable to false and see what happens. Does accuracy drop? What happens to training speed? Maybe try some regularization and see what happens. word to vec isn't the only algorithm to generate embeddings. There's also Glove, which relies on global co-occurrence counts to create embeddings. There's doc to vec which is an algorithm to represent whole documents as a dense vector. And there's also fast text, which performs subword tokenization. That is, rather than having one vector per word, fast text vectorizes n-grams. The vector for a word, then, is the sum of its n-gram vectors. And this can help handle out-of-vocabulary situations. We'll cover subword tokenization later in the course. Okay, so we just looked at some cool traits of word vectors and how to use them in model training, and we got pretty good results for not much effort. But static embeddings have a few shortcomings. The first is that they're cumbersome to scale. Language is constantly changing and new words are always coming in. With one static embedding per word, we would either need to keep expanding the number of vectors or settle for out-of-word situations. Now, at the end of the demo, fast text was mentioned, which tokenizes n-grams and mitigates the issue, but later in the course, we'll take a look at more sophisticated subword tokenizers. The second and bigger issue is that each word is represented by only a single vector, regardless of the current context, but we know that's not how words work. A word can have multiple senses, depending on the context. Words such as cell, bat, bank, play, and so on mean different things, depending on their surrounding words. Later in the course, we'll look at contextualized word embeddings, which offer different vectors for the same word, depending on the context. Okay, so in this video, we looked at how to vectorize words in a way which captures some of their meaning relative to other words, and how to use those vectors in a classification model. In the next video, we're going to move back up to the level of documents, and look at models which can take word order into account. We'll also train models to generate language.